kinetics of nuclear decay. So it's all the same kinetics you learned about once upon a time. What order are most nuclear decay reactions? Our first order. And so for nuclear decay, we don't have to tell you that they're, you know, we don't have to tell you the order because we expect you to remember that they're all first order. In the kinetics chapter, any given reaction could have been zero order, first order, second order, and depending on what order, you would know which equation to use. Well, now for any nuclear reaction, you always know to use the first order equations. So in your first order equations, so it could be expressed this way, you could rearrange it a little bit. Make it look like this, something along these lines. The other one they usually give you is they'll give you the half-life for it. So, question. Is the reason when you subtract it over the ln of a, it's just like the algebra it makes a division? Correct. So when you, t when you subtract the ln a naught over the other side, a subtracting of logs, you can combine them under the same log term by dividing. Right. So total property of logs, multiplying, or actually adding logs would have been multiplying, and yeah, exactly. Cool. So these will be on the front page of your exam. They'll be listed under first order. You just got to know where to look. So the key is, for a first order reaction, the half-life is constant no matter what the concentration is. So it doesn't mean that the rate of decay is constant. That's actually slowing down, but the half-life time is constant. So, and oftentimes the questions you'll involve, you know, that you're gonna do involved in this chapter will involve probably things involving half-life. So, and you can deal with these in a number of different ways. You can deal with these in terms of grams. Let's say I've got 64 grams of a radioactive substance. How many grams of it would be left after a half-life? 32 grams, how much would be left after another half-life? 16 grams, another half-life. Eight grams, another half-life. Four grams, and so on and so forth, right? You can also look at this not just in grams. You could look at these in percentages. What percent of your sample do you originally start with? All of it, so 100%. What percent would be left after one half-life? 50% second half-life. 25% third half-life. And a fourth half-life, 6.25%, so on and so forth. Just keep dividing by two. Cool, you could also do this in fractions. Again, initially you'd start with all of it, so one. What fraction would be left after one half-life? Half. After another half-life, one-fourth, another half-life, one-eighth, and another half-life one sixteenth, and so on and so forth. So we can also do something a little newer here as well. So we can also measure these in activities. So an activity is a measure of radioactivity. So, and we can measure those radio, you know, the radioactivity in different units and stuff like that. So but the big thing you might measure it with is a Geiger counter. And you're probably gonna get counts per second or counts per minute more likely. So when you, anybody know what a Geiger counter is? So it's that thing you see in movies when there's nuclear radiation around, they point it at stuff and you hear it ticking. So, and when it gets near something radioactive, you'll hear it tick a lot more. And it's just measuring how many radioactive decays are happening in the vicinity, and every tick corresponds to a, a radioactive event. And so when it ticks more often, you know, you're getting more radioactivity. And so, you know, if you're going around and this thing starts going crazy, you know it's probably good to walk somewhere else. So we used to have a professor, he retired, but he had a Geiger counter. And he would bring it into class during the nuclear chemistry section. And he also had a radioactive rock that he'd stick in his pocket. And so he'd go up so, and just start going around the room. And you hear this thing tick, tick. There's a certain, back, you know, certain minimum level of background radiation that happens any, everywhere. So you hear it tick every once in a while. And so then he would, while well, students weren't looking, pull this rock out of his pocket. And as he pointed it to the prettiest girl in the front row, he'd put the Geiger counter in his other hand with the rock in it. And this thing would just start going crazy as he pointed at this girl. And he's like, wow, 
this girl is really radioactive. When something is this radioactive, we usually refer to that object as being really hot. So as you can see, this girl is really hot. So, and she'd blush, and students would, you know, start laughing and stuff. And they'd like, he'd be like, actually, I had this radioactive rock in my hand, and he pointed back at her, and nothing. And he'd be like, so as you can see, she's really not hot. <laughs> it's really terrible, but really funny nonetheless. So, but needless to say, Geiger counter can measure the activity. And so, let's say I told you that the activity initially here was say 20 counts per minute. What would the activity be after a half-life? 10. If you have half as much radioactive substance there, then you'd only have half the activity as well. And so it works in these units as well. So 10 counts per minute. So, and then 5 counts per minute. Then 2.5 counts per minute. So, and then 1.25 counts per minute. So for radioactivity, we can got another way to measure the concentration of that radioactive substance. All right, so the types of questions you might get on something like this is, let's say I told you that you started with 64 grams of a radioactive substance, and twenty-four hours later, you only had four grams left. Question you might get is, what's the half-life? Well, how many half-lives have we gone through to get all the way to four grams? One, two, three, four. We've gone through four half-lives, and it took a total of 24 hours. So then how, much, how long much each of those half-lives be? Other way around? Good. Split 24 hours into four equivalent periods of time, and you get six hours. So each half-life was six hours. Six hours, 12 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours. So that could be a kind of question you might get. Or they could totally reverse this on you. Notice, what if I told you instead that you started with 64 grams of radioactive substance, and I said that the half-life is six hours. The half-life is six hours. And so then I turned it backwards. I said, how much would you have left after 24 hours? Well, you'd be like six hours, 24 hours. Well, every six hours a half-life, cut it in half. So over 24 hours, how many times would you have to cut it in half? Four and you'd be left with four grams. So you could flip it around like that as well. Now, hopefully, you're gonna get nice round numbers. But what if I said the half-life here is six hours? And what if I said, how much would you have left after 20 hours? Well, that's tricky, right? Because it's not a perfect number of six-hour periods, a perfect number of half-lives. 20 hours should be between what and what in this case? So, well, six hours gets me here. 12 hours, another six hours, would get me there. 18 hours would get me there. 24 hours would get me there. So if this would be after 18 hours, and this would be 24 hours, then 20 hours should be somewhere between four and eight. Now, if there's only one answer choice there, awesome. Pick it. But what if there were three different answer choices all right in this region between four and eight grams? then you're going to have to do a little more plugging and chugging. If it's not a perfect number of half-lives, then you've got to go back here. So to one of these two. So, and actually, you probably use all of them. And the key to being able to having, you know, the key to plugging and chugging these is you've got an OK. Because I told you the half-life was six hours, then you can figure out K. Giving you the half-life is the equivalent of giving you K for something that's first order. And then once you know the K, then you can use either one of these, plug the K value back in, plug your 20 hours of time back in, plug in the original concentration, in this case of 64 grams, and then solve for what the final concentration would have been. So, but really common on this exam is to get something involving nice, even numbers of half-lives. So nice round numbers, whole numbers of half-lives. So let's talk about radiocarbon dating for a minute. So radiocarbon dating, you hear a lot about this, you know, in a variety of different topics and stuff like that, your biology class, for instance, stuff. So we just got to talk about what it is, how it works, and what it's effective for accomplishing. So radiocarbon dating, so it involves 
one of your more rare carbon isotopes, carbon-14. So 99% of naturally occurring carbon on planet Earth is carbon-12. Most of that other 1% is carbon-13. A very, very tiny fraction of a percent, though, is carbon-14. Where does this carbon-14 come from? So, well, it doesn't actually come from the organic life. The organic, it gets incorporated in organic life, but... So, good. Cosmic radiation in the atmosphere. So, and the cosmic radiation in the atmosphere turns nitrogen-14 into carbon-14. And we could balance this out, but that's not the purpose here. So, it turns nitrogen-14 into carbon-14. That's where it comes from. And this carbon-14 then gets incorporated into radioactive carbon dioxide. That's the key. From the nitrogen, the cosmic rays turn it into carbon, and then that carbon is, becomes part of carbon dioxide. What, how does that carbon dioxide get then into living creatures? Plants. Good, plants. Anything that does photosynthesis, that's what they use as fuel. They breathe in carbon dioxide. So all the plants, all the algae, so anything that's photosynthetic starts using this up and incorporating it into their structure. And so most of their carbon will still be carbon-12 and a little bit of carbon-13, but a teeny tiny bit of carbon-14 will be present in those plants. So, and then that carbon-14 is going to decay, and so they lose some because it radioactively decays, but then they bring, bring more in as they incorporate more radioactive carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And eventually, you know, in a short period of time, they reach some sort of equilibrium level of carbon-14 in their system. So as long as they're still bringing carbon dioxide in, so what about, that's where, okay, plants, anything that does photosynthesis. Any of you guys do photosynthesis? Cool, I didn't think so. So how do you guys get radioactive carbon-14 in your system. You eat plants. You eat plants. You eat algae. Maybe. Maybe. So, or maybe you eat something, you know, maybe you eat plankton. Maybe you're one of those people that uh, eats the plankton out of the ocean rather than eats the tuna. Um, cool, but you eat plants. Well, you might be like, Chad, <laughs> I don't eat plants. Cool, but you eat the animals that ate the plants. So one way, shape, or form, we all, any living creature, is going to get radioactive carbon-14 in its system. Either because they're the ones taking in the carbon dioxide, they're eating, in, you know, they're eating the plants that took in the carbon dioxide, or they're eating the animals that ate the plants that took in the carbon dioxide. But every living creature at some point will get a certain constant level of radioactive carbon-14. That's the principle. So what you can do then is date anything that was once alive. Because when will an organism stop taking in radioactive carbon-14? When it dies. And so you have a timestamp of when that organism dies. And so if you compare how much radioactive carbon, so let's we'll say in a piece of firewood found in an Indian cave somewhere, you know, if you find out how much radioactive carbon-14 is in that wood, you can compare it to how much there would have been if it was still alive by just comparing it to something that's still alive. So we assume that the amount of carbon-14 in living organisms today has been you know, the same in all living organisms for the last you know, 50 to 70,000 years. So that's one of the big assumptions we make. So, and by comparing how much you know, a sample has now compared to how much a living sample would have, we can kind of get an idea based on the radioactivity of how many half-lives it's gone through. And so the half-life for this radioactive carbon-14 is somewhere around 5,700 years. So 5,730 years. So let's say I knew that a living sample today, its radioactivity was 20 counts per minute. And so I found this wood in an Indian's cave somewhere, and it only had 10 counts per minute. Well, then I'd know it's 5,730 years old. So that tree was cut down or whatever a little over 5,000 years ago. So if you look. 20 to 10 to 5 to 2.5 to 1.25 and so on and so forth. Every time you cut this in half, you get less and less. It turns out after about 10 half-lives, give or take, there's so little radioactive carbon-14 that you just can't reliably measure it. And so past that point, this does not work. And so as a result, radioactive, you know, radiocarbon dating is really only effective 
at measuring the age of something up to about 50,000, maybe to 70,000 years. And the older it is, the less reliable it gets because you're just kind of measuring really tiny concentrations. So, but notice when we start dating things in the millions or billions of years, we're not using this. We're using other radioactive techniques, but radiocarbon dating only can date something if it was once alive and only effective up to about 50,000, maybe 70,000 years at the most. Questions on how this works? So you could be given a question on this as well. And you could be given, you know, the counts in a, in a living tree, how much radioactive carbon it has based on the counts per minute. And then you could say a certain sample was found, it has this many counts, and it's just a radioactive decay question. You use the first order integrated rate law, same calculations we just covered.